All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not All Propaganda is Art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, April 24th, 1951, black students at Robert Rusa Moulton High School in the town of Farmville, Virginia, walked out of school to protest the conditions of their education, which were vastly inferior to that of white students at a nearby school, Farmville High School. The strike was led by a student named Barbara Johns, who pointed out that her school had some 450 students crammed into one single-story building. Tar paper shacks had been built outside to handle the overflow flow. No laboratories, no gym, no cafeteria. So the students walked out. And that act, in many ways, was the start of the school's desegregation movement in America. The court case that resulted from this protest would eventually be bundled with other cases and would eventually reach the Supreme Court and lead to the landmark Brown versus Board of Education ruling, which deemed segregation in schools unconstitutional. So let's talk about Moton, Barbara Johns, the first spark that eventually led to Brown v. Board. Here to discuss, as always, are Nicole Hammer of Columbia and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley, host of Oprademics. I got to keep sneaking that in, but hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. Uh, and contributors to our newsletter, which is coming soon as well. So, yes, uh, we all do lots of things. Um, so, <laughs> but, uh, Barbara Johns, amazing. Uh, we'll get into her. This strike, or sorry, this walkout which actually I think maybe they did call it a strike. But Kelly, can we talk a little bit about just sort of mm -hmm. Virginia um, and the mid-Atlantic, you know, so a place yeah. that, that when we think of civil rights protests, maybe we think more deep south, but. Oh, absolutely. I think we're geared, programmed, and fairly so, to see the civil rights movement through a very deep South lens. So we think of, mm -hmm. you know, Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia. We don't necessarily think of Virginia. And I think, you know, when we covered Gloria Richardson uh, a couple weeks back, we, we talked about Maryland, Cambridge, Maryland, and what it means to sort of see the civil rights struggle play out there. But similar things are happening in Virginia as well. You know, people want better schools for their children, really all across the country. That's not a phenomenon that's sort of stuck in the South. But to see this individual school pushing for this and to see parents and students getting involved in this way is quite remarkable. And I think it's something that's been left out of our textbook, certainly left out of the public memory in terms of how we think of school segregation. Yeah. I'm curious, Kelly, whether one of the reasons you see this early activism in places like Maryland and Virginia or Topeka, Kansas, is there, is it safer than in the Deep South mm. to mm. protest? Um, is Are you less likely to be uh, responded to with kind of abject, overt, overwhelming violence? Mm. I mean safer I, I might put an asterisk you know it's yeah still, it's still dangerous it's still troublesome if pushing these boundaries 
But I will say that there's more opportunity. There's a little bit more flexibility. I think being in proximity to Washington, D.C. is also interesting as well, because for a long time, you had black mm-hmm. people who were working in the government sector who were being paid similar wages. You know, Washington, D.C. became a place you could go to for for economic and social uplift. And so some of that certainly spills out into the DMV area and people are being more empowered to push for certain things to demand certain things that there's just no infrastructure to do in the south um so the federal government does create space for people to test boundaries Hmm. and of course you know this ends up in the courts the NAACP gets involved the NAACP was doing organizing Mm -hmm. all around the country but I do wonder if proximity to DC means maybe a little more access to lawyers Mm -hmm. and activists and people who are sort of in in those circles um you know I will say this stuff about the the mid-Atlantic's role is is fascinating I mean obviously both Maryland and Virginia below the Mason-Dixon line and I was just looking Mm -hmm. at Farmville today on a map you know and because I know this region a little bit I grew up in the DC area and you know Farmville really close to Appomattox, really close to Lynchburg, Virginia, which I know was named after a person mm-hmm. named Lynch, but still it's like, I can't believe there's still a city called Lynchburg. Um, right. But yeah. which yeah. is all to say, like, clearly the legacy of the Civil War and slavery are still mm-hmm. very much present in these places, even though they are not in the quote unquote deep South. Um, and students there feel it in all the ways we were about to describe. So, you know, this school, I described a little of the conditions, a school entirely composed of black students. Um the way in which they pulled off this protest and this strike is really fascinating to me. So let's go through some of the details of how they actually staged this walkout, which then led to such to, to so many bigger things. So the story of the walkout is a story that is both civil rights... Uh, bravery and high school hijinks. Um, (laughs) So you have uh, uh, Barbara Johns, who is the main organizer at the school, and she had become frustrated with these conditions that you were talking about. She confides to a music teacher about it. um, And the teacher was like, well, why don't you do something about it? And so what she does is she helps to organize the students and stage the strike. But the high school hijinks part of it comes in how they lure the principal away so that they are able to uh, to hold this strike. Um, they have someone from outside call the principal, pretend to be law enforcement, saying that some students had been downtown, they were causing trouble, he needed to come pick them up. And so the principal leaves the school Um As he leaves, uh, Barbara Johns forges a note to the teachers, purportedly from the principal, saying that they had to assemble the student body. And as they assemble the student body, it creates the conditions that allows these students to walk out. Yeah. And the strike is so big in that you have 450 students. And the genius of this is that while people are afraid and intimidated that they might be, you know, arrested, they came to the conclusion that like, wait a second, the jailhouse is not big enough to hold all of us. So we might as well protest because they can't collectively do something to all of us. And and being in solidarity with that is really what made it sort of stand out. This is not just one or two people that they could throw away. They had to deal with all of the students at the same time. Yeah, yeah. What happens next is also really important. I think because of those kinds of connections that Kelly was talking about, this relationship with Washington, D.C., middle class parents who are working in the federal government, um, the students call upon lawyers at the NAACP. They want help in getting equal educational opportunities. And the NAACP comes back with, well, we're happy to help you with this, but it's got to be bigger than just your school. It has to be a push for this kind of not just equal space for students, that idea of separate but equal that the the Supreme Court uh, set down in Plessy v. Ferguson, but to begin to chip away at the conditions of segregation themselves. It's worth noting that Barbara Johns is also the niece of Reverend Vernon Johns, who um, I think preceded Martin Luther King as the pastor of a church in Montgomery, Alabama. I don't know if he actually sort of chipped in, but certainly she has that those circles and that sort of uh, DNA in her. But I think this this point about kind of the NAACP coming in and saying, because the students are... They're students, you know, and they're like, mostly I want 
a good cafeteria and I want gym class and I want, you know, to not be in a freezing cold in a paper shack when, in you know, when I'm, when I'm being taught and the NAACP comes in and says, well, you know, there's a larger fight to be had here. And we've talked about it a number of times on the show. It's worth highlighting, you know, the NAACP is very strategic about finding cases and mm-hmm. finding cases that they feel like have legs and are test cases. And, you know, this is what this is what lawyers, particularly civil rights lawyers do. But they they find cases not just where there's a moral clarity, but cases where they can and then feel like there's a larger fight. And so any yeah, sense of they why they, win. yeah. And so any sense of why this case in particular felt was like one of the first tributaries that then eventually led to being glommed together with other cases to eventually lead to Brown v. Board? I mean, there are a lot of cases I think that lead to or contribute to what becomes Brown v. Board that I don't think people know about. There are even cases in the 19th century that I think are really interesting in terms of how we think of segregation and integration in the North. Mm -hmm. But I think that one of the things that the NAACP can get around is by having a a case in which is so clear cut and undeniable, it makes their chances at a victory well, it's never a sure thing, but but as close to a sure thing as they possibly can. And I think the best example of that was Brown v. Board. But like, but those circumstances have to be so perfect in order for them to have nothing that will interfere yeah. with their chances. And I suppose part of that is in this case, for instance, another school in the same town where you can just do a one-to-one comparison, right? Yeah. And I think that's a huge part of it as well. And I think you also have the conditions in Moton that make it possible for what Brown really does, which it says separate is never equal. Because what happens yeah. a few years after this strike is that the Black students in Moton get a nicer school. They get a school Mm -hmm. where the facilities are equivalent to the ones at the white school in the county. Um, But it's still not equal because the condition of separateness is part of the inequality. That's the big case that the lawyers in Brown make. Um, So you kind of have the conditions there for tearing down the kind of basic idea of separate but equal. Mm Mm-hmm. And as we've been saying, John's, when she talked about this case later on, she talked in, I think, in 1988, she gave an interview and she said, you know, the NAACP lawyer said, this needs to be a fight for integration, not just against school conditions. And that was the best way to accomplish our goals. And they went for that. And there was a Davis versus school board of Prince Edward County. And that advanced through the courts. And then along with four other cases, as we've been saying, ends up at the Supreme Court. It's Brown v. Board, which Nikki's reference to Topeka, Kansas, not just a passing reference, so that's where <laughs> Brown <random>. Board was, <laughs> was based. Um, you know, but that um and that eventually ends up with this landmark ruling. So going to Brown v. Board, I don't think we've talked about it on the show. Um, you know, I think everyone knows the sort of thumbnail sketch of it declared segregation unconstitutional. Um what happens in the immediate aftermath of that, Kelly, and what happens in this mm. part of Virginia is not that. It is a real fight back. There was major, major resistance to uh, integration. There still is. Um, But what happens is what happens all across the country in that there are school systems, whole school districts that basically say, "Mm, we'd rather not have school. And they basically like close down the schools, shut down certain schools. Um, There's two years that are just completely missing from the lives of black students because the school district said, rather than integrate, we rather just shut it all down. And and shortly after this, you get, you know, private schools and parochial schools and other alternatives where people don't have to integrate. But there was major resistance. And in Prince Edward County, it's actually five years. Between 1959 and oh, 1964, wow. they closed down the schools. White students are able to move to a new private school that's supported by tuition grants and other donations and so forth, and black students are left without schooling. Yeah, and even in places uh, where they don't have the private school option. So in Charlottesville, Virginia, they also closed down the schools for several years. The white parents hire private tutors, Mm -hmm. and the black parents try to do the same. They try to have some form of education for their children, but they often have fewer resources in order to do so. And so that Mm -hmm. inequality is still baked into the system. And that story of the school closings helps explain why, you know, six years after Brown, 
something like 1% of segregated school systems have been desegregated. So you have this landmark Supreme Court ruling, but nothing much actually happens in the aftermath to put it into action. Hmm. Yeah. And even when you do get integration, I think of like the Little Rock Nine, it's it's terrifying trying mm-hmm. to send less than a dozen black students to an all white school and the National Guard has to be called in. I mean, that um, these are not at all the conditions that people expected or wanted when they thought about integration. Yeah. And on that point of the threat to students, I mean, it's worth noting, you know, I asked earlier if it was safer, like Barbara Johns faces threats across is burned in her parents' yard. And she's ultimately sent to live with an uncle in Montgomery yeah. in order to finish her schooling. So this yeah. was not a, a no cost fight that she picked up. Yeah. Um, in March of 63. So as the Prince Edward County schools are shut down, um, there is a centennial celebration for the Emancipation Proclamation and um, RFK, attorney general at that time, says, quote, the only places on earth not to provide free public education are communist China, North Vietnam, mm-hmm. Sarawak, Singapore, British Honduras, and Prince Edward County, Virginia. Mm. Incredible line. Pretty stunning. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, as we said, the schools reopen in 64. Obviously, you know, a five years, an entire generation of lost of schooling. It takes a long time yeah. to try and close those gaps, even as, as even as there's continued resistance of other kinds. Um, in 2003, Prince Edward County did hold a symbolic graduation f- f- ceremony for what they called the lost generation of, of school kids who, who, who never got those opportunities. Um, as you said, Barbara Johns moved to... Alabama. She continued to be active. She died in 1991 at the age of 56 of cancer. In 2008, a sculpture of her was unveiled at the Virginia State Capitol in Richmond. Really nice capital. Lots of cool sculptures there. Some of them a little dicey. Some of them about people (laughs) like Barbara Johns. So go check that out uh, if you're ever in Richmond. Yeah, well, they were slated to. We'll see if it still happens. But they're slated to replace the Robert E. Lee statue with the statue of Barbara Johns. Uh So that's pretty cool. Yeah. That would be a very symbolic replacement. I know. I know. Yeah. And then all the schools that are named after Lee and not named after John's, we can move to those next. (laughs) No, Uh, can we do a name spot for that too? (laughs) Um, Oh, by the way, yeah, I was actually looking at this, that um, we've sort of passively referenced Moton High School. Robert Moton, really, really interesting character in and of itself. The person this school was named after, but um, he was the administrator at Hampton Institute. And then he was, um, after Booker T. Washington died, he took over at the Tuskegee Institute and ran that for... um, for many many years as well so uh maybe another person to circle around to Um, yeah that sounds really cool yeah yeah um all right well that brings us to the end of the episode uh nicole hammer thanks to you thank you jody and kelly carter jackson go check out opridemics everyone thanks to you (laughs) my pleasure (laughs) we wanted so much here and had so little and we had uh talents and abilities here that weren't really being realized and I thought that was a tragic shame.